I'm Scotty D, and this is an Epiphone Model 3, made in New York, late 20s, early 30s, very rare flat top with a round sound hole and an arched back, which also means there's no braces on the back, which makes it very resonant and light, and it's very lightly braced and built, so it's just one of those magical wonderful sounding guitars doesn't play too great so let's take a look the Epiphone Model 3 serial number 3890 yep this was in their very first years of flat top production had staggered bridge pins and well you can see this one's a little weird they've cut that away to get lower action but it's so low that the string is just gliding right across the top of the saddle. So maybe you're replacing that, but uh, we have kind of high action here. We have like 9 64ths, and we have super small frets. They're 25 thousandths tall and only 65 thousandths wide. So I think we're going to do a neck reset, refret, and get a little bit taller saddle and maybe even a new insert piece here made out of rosewood instead of... Uh, that looks like ebony. So I think it would look better if it was rosewood and if it went the entire length and it fit the whole area there. All right, hey, Model 3. Doesn't get any cooler than that. They did make a Model 0, Model 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the higher end models had the, uh, the staggered pins. And there's a few other differences I'll tell you about as we go. Yeah. It says the lower models, you know, like 0 through 2, had flat backs. Well, this one being an arched back means it's a laminated back. And it might have evidence of a previous neck reset here. There's a hole right there, which is right about where the end of the dovetail would be. And it did, it used to have a pick guard. So this, this baby sounds amazing weird thing how the strings come around the outside of each post? That's because the gears are on top. Usually they're below. You know what I mean? Like you could flip these over and but then you'd run out of real estate over here I think. So this is the way it's gotta be.
So check this out. See all this kind of uh, cracked finish? I know we call it lacquer and everything, but back in those days it was most likely it was shellac. Or a finish that is composed of mostly shellac. So watch this. This is denatured alcohol. I'm just going to brush it on here to kind of hydrate all those cracks. And keep them from... It's going to blush a little bit. But I want to keep all these cracks from from keep it from chipping away I can always buff that out later I want to keep what we got on there intact maybe I'll just let this sit overnight let that harden back up and then start heating it again tomorrow I got ambitious and I'm back at it after an hour I decided to to try a little more water down in the hole I use a pipette to pipe in room temperature water down into the hole and then I jam the heat stick down in there and it kind of boils and creates a little steam and it was kind of stubborn getting it out but uh, after about 12 minutes it I could definitely feel that the joint was uh, becoming loose So let's uh, let's pull this neck. See what's going on in there. Seems like it's got a big old dovetail. There we go. Moist and hot. Yowza! That's a pretty stout dovetail. Sometimes these guys are so stubborn that by the time they finally pop, I feel like I've given birth. Well, I think I'm going to take the weekend off and resume this video on Monday. Peace! Now it's time to fill in the missing wood on the bridge plate. I'm going to take this foam block and there's a lot of missing stuff there. So in the old days they used to try to tear the bridge plate out, but these days we can drop in CA glue with uh, maple fibers and repair everything up. And it's very quick. So let me get the jack out. First I accelerate. And I get the jack. This guitar has an arched back with no braces on the back, so it's really easy this time. So the center line shows me I'll get it right in the middle. We'll put down some low tech tape around the area so we don't drop super glue all over the top of this beauty full guitar. These are maple fibers. They come from a hard rock maple board. You want to take a rasp on the edge of the board. I'm emphasizing that it's not end grain sawdust. It is fibers. They interlock with each other once the CA glue goes in. Pack it down like you're getting ready to shoot your musket loader and then this is the water thin CA glue Stumac number 10 three drops per hole we accelerated once but we'll accelerate twice and three times it'll become a rock hard repair.
we'll have to re-drill the holes. Let's pack in some more. We don't want to go all the way to the top with these. We just want to repair the bridge plate and the soundboard. The rosewood bridge itself is probably fine. And you'd be surprised, this, this happens to a lot of guitars. After 20 years or so of restringing a guitar, that bridge plate gets beat up. We'll continue dropping CA glue and accelerating. Be very nice when it's done. I can go inside and grab the jack. If it's not stuck, it's always stuck just a little bit. That's why I use this uh, press and seal over the foam. It's ready for a new, a new piece. So it's nice and smooth and fixed up on the inside. It's warm. There's a chemical reaction going on, endothermic reaction. It's, it really warms up. Let that cool off and cure. And uh, can also take like some of the glue boost. Take some of the accelerator on a paper towel and go inside with it. Just accelerate the crap out of it. Usually sand the inside a little bit too with some 220 grit. I figure before I go much further, I'm going to fix this area. I made this little piece out in the garage. I cut it up with my band saw from this uh, big old bridge blank of Indian rosewood. By the way, I just love the smell of Indian rosewood in the morning. And I roughed it in on the spindle sander. And now I'm going to glue it in with hot hide glue. Well, I should sand it a little bit first. But um, I'm going to wipe it with acetone. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to wipe this with acetone to get the rosewood oil up and out and dehydrate the wood so that it sucks up that HHG and makes a permanent bond. HHG for you and me. That's right. HGR likes hot hide glue. Hot hide glue for me and you. Acetone. I want to make sure you don't get acetone on the guitar finish. Peel it right off of there. It's got, it's kind of like nail polish remover. Okay, so this, this, this wood is thirsty for some glue now. I soaked up so much of that oil out of there. It's gonna, it's gonna grab right on. This is the hydrated hide glue. I won't need much. It's never been heated yet. This is fresh. I, I mix up a half cup or so and I keep it in the refrigerator. This is no longer an ancient Chinese secret, but a modern luthier's tool. So I'll put it right here in this hot water. It'll melt pretty quickly. Wait for it to get liquid and then we'll uh, slather it on there. Okay, it's nice and liquid. It is hot. Whew.
Oh man. I'll clamp it down with these four clamps overnight, come back tomorrow and start whittling away at it. Actually, before I start whittling, I'm going to route the saddle slot. I'm going to use the eighth inch bit. It's an upcut bit from Stumac. The upcut bit leaves a really nice and flat bottom to the slot. I make a few passes. Make one shallow pass, and then I'll uh, take, you know, I'll I'll adjust the depth of the router base. This is a Waverly router base. I've had that for 25 years, and it's still running strong. Same thing with the Dremel. That baby's old. God, I love the smell of Indian rosewood in the morning. There ain't nothing better, except for donuts. Warm donuts. I've got that glued in, and I've got a saddle roughed in. It's an unbleached bone. That's yeah, in there tight. If I can get it out, please. Yeah. And it's a, it's a good three millimeter. It's a big thicky, but. I'll continue to do some of the sanding and sand off the super glue stuff while I'm at it. I'm going to ramp these slots a little bit further because these are it's a really long distance from the saddle to the pinhole. It's abnormal and it makes the string take on a very slight ramp. I want it, I want it a little deeper ramp for the string to go down into, especially for this low E. I'll continue to hone that down a little. I do filing, sanding, and scraping. And by the way, the saddle slot depth is three millimeters. The total height of the saddle is six millimeters, which is giving me a string height from the soundboard of half inch, which is pushing the limits of how tall you want to make a saddle. So my goal is to set the neck where I can lower it just a couple more eyelashes to fine tune it when we're all said and done. Maybe get the string height about three eighths above the soundboard. This was that area that blushed the other day. And I'm going to take a little bit of polishing compound See if we can get rid of all that. It really kind of went away on its own, but we'll just give it a quick little polish. It looks a lot better now than it did, actually. Now I'm removing some of the wood from the heel cheeks with a rasp and a file and probably some sandpaper. I also use a chisel. Use the chisel to undercut the heel. So that while I'm filing and sanding, I'm just hitting the perimeter of the heel. Now I'll create those string ramps that I was just talking about. I like to hold the guitar with its head down in the total vice number seven. 
kind of puts the bridge pinholes at about eye level for me. Next, I'll put the guitar into the proper's guitar workstation by Total Vice and check the neck angle several times. I'll string it up a few times. When I know that I've got the angle I want, just before setting the neck, I'll sand everything smooth with 80 and 120 grit sandpaper. I've also shimmed up the dovetail on the male side. The neck side of the dovetail has been shimmed with little maple veneers. They're about 20 thousandths of an inch. Then I'll heat up the neck area and the body area with the hair dryer. It gives the hot hide glue a little extra open time. That way it doesn't gel as fast. Hot hide glue for me and you. You see HGR likes HHG. HHG for you and me. Hot hide is the it be. But you gotta work fast. You don't want it to get all gelatinous. And I did a little undercut at the top of the dovetail there. In between the fretboard extension and the top of the dovetail, which looks like the bottom of the dovetail right here. So I'm gonna jam a little bit of that hot hide glue in there with this feeler gauge. That reduces the neck to body joint hump that you'll get a lot of times on a neck reset. Now I'll put the two pieces together and force them into place with one little four inch bar clamp. Sorry, I didn't have the great angle for you guys to see that clamp, but I'll tighten it up with the clamp and then I'll lay it back down. I've got these two red oak calls they uh, fit between the frets. Imagine there's a f there's two extra frets there, which there aren't. But anyways, it's a red oak call that has been radiused to about 10 inches on the bottom side. That's old Scooter, the Boston Terrier. There, he's whining. He wants a treat. But this allows me to. Um, use four clamps that each clamp being around the outer side of the fretboard out towards the binding it'll um, put the pressure just where I need it for this job for some reason you really needed a little extra pressure right there around the 16th fret remember this this guitar is weird it it joins the body at the 13th fret those C clamps are actually um, Stumac sells those as uh, sound hole clamps, but they're usually people use them for bridges. And that's for the fretboard extension this time. I'll tighten them up with the pliers and hope for a little bit of squeeze out. And then one quick grip clamp down here. Very nice. I also created a, a small wedge to go underneath the fretboard extension and put some liquid binding around the whole thing so it kind of disguised it. Now that the neck is set, we'll get started next day on the refret. We'll pull out these, uh, these old guys and put in some new guys. I also wanted to start doing my little um, roughed in rosewood plug where the steam hole was. I'll end up sanding that down and cutting through the fret slot. Oh, Scooter's getting thirsty over here. 
Let's take this nut out. Let's get nutty. I don't think that's ever been pulled out before. Ignition file. Nut seating file. I'll do a little 80 grit sandpaper on a 12 inch radius block, which right away I could see that it's a nine and a half inch radius. So there we go, nine and a half inch radius on a 80 grit sandpaper. This is called a refret saw. So you can saw between the bindings. It's 18 thousandths of an inch wide. Suction. We'll radius the uh, fret wire to about seven and a quarter. So I'm over radiusing it. I just do the end one fret at a time and cut it to size. Um, cut off the fret tangs it's just shy of where the binding is. Then uh, use liquid hide glue in each slot. Spread it around with the X-Acto blade. And then I'll hammer it home. And as it flattens out to the nine and a half inch radius, yeah, the barbs will dig in should be held in there very nice. Next day I'll cut off the ends of the frets and they'll fall into that trash can down below. Back into the proper's guitar workstation with my snap file. We'll trim those down and bevel them. Next I'll clean the file with a wire brush and I'll remove the uh, the mill file and replace it with the diamond file. This is called an offset crowning file. Notice how I've taped off the body to protect it. You gotta be real careful when removing that tape. You gotta heat it up with a hairdryer. This is the fret end dressing file. This is sandpaper on a stick. I use 120, 220, 320, and 400. And I stick the different grits on each side of the stick. Then I use a three corner file after leveling. Looks like I didn't get any footage of the leveling. Well, you know what that looks like. Then I'll do the polishing with my scrub block. I go 320 all the way through 2000 with the scrub block with the maroon scotch bright pad in between the 320 and 4 and a gray scotch bright pad between just after the 1000 grit. This actually blends in the fretboard wood making the rosewood look old again. And the refret was a success. There's no buzzing frets, and it's all feeling really great. And I just lowered the saddle to its final resting place, where it gives us 5 64ths action here and 4 64ths action here. The fretboard has just about a 9.5 inch radius to it. But what I was going to tell you about the bridge is. I didn't fill in the area around my plug. Just in case someone wants to revert back to the way it was, they can find that seam a little easier and heat it up and get that off of there. Okay. So that's one thing. 
The next thing is that I did is that I notched the saddle, which I normally don't do, but in this case, you know, we don't have a great brake angle, even though the saddle is twice as high as where it was to begin with. It's, uh, the thing is, is that the pinholes weren't drilled exactly to the perfect spacing, so I had to kind of co, you know, fudge the, uh, these little ramps a little bit, and I also had to use these little notches here in the saddle to help keep the strings in perfect spacing within each other. And that'll just be a reminder to the owner uh, when he changes the strings to make sure that those each string finds its little notch. And it also helps when you don't have a great brake angle like this here. Sometimes when you don't have a great brake angle, because the, there's a long distance here between the pinhole and the saddle, that's the main reason there's not a good brake angle. Um, the string will tend to kind of glide over the top of the saddle and sound like a sitar. There is a chance that that could happen. So that's another reason I notched it. Other than that, I think we're ready. We're ready. Thank you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks for getting me up to a million views on YouTube. Thanks for hanging out and I'll catch you later.